So um, C stands for School of Slavonic and East European <coughs> Studies. One of the world's leading institutions for the study of Central Eastern uh, Europe, uh, Southeastern Europe, Russia, and indeed Eurasia. So when we say Eurasia, we mean the former Soviet Union, everything that stretches from uh, St. Petersburg to Vladivostok near China. And we're a multidisciplinary school or department. Um, and just to sort of clarify, we are both a research institute that calls itself a school and a department like any other department within the university. So school and department. Um, and we're multidisciplinary. So this means that you don't just do history at CIS or just do economics. We have economics and business. Uh, we have languages and culture. And I'll talk a bit more in a bit more detail in a moment about which languages uh, we offer. Uh, we have history, which is what I teach in. And we have politics and sociology. Um, we were founded in 1915. So the year before last, we had our 100 year centenary. Um, which means that we've been providing expertise on this region uh, for over 100 years, which also makes us one of the oldest centers for the study of Russia, Eastern and Central Europe in the world. Um, we have around 850 uh, students at any given time, uh, and they come from over 60 countries. So we have students, of course, from the UK, but we also have students from across the EU. We have students from the region that we study, Russia and uh, Eastern Europe. And then we have students coming from Australia, from China, from the US all over. So it's not only an international a subject matter that you study if you come to CIS, it's also a very international student body. Um, we also have over 70 academic staff, uh, and they also come from all over the world. I come from Australia. I'm not sure if you can tell from my accent. Uh, and I have lots of colleagues from the UK, of course, but also from Russia, from Serbia, from the United mm. States, from Brazil, uh, from all over. Um, and all of us are active researchers in this field. So as well as teaching about the history, about the politics, about the culture of Russia and Eastern Europe, uh, we also are doing research on this region. Um, all of us uh, travel often to the region. I'm flying to Moscow on Monday uh, to do some research and to meet with some uh, professors there. Uh, and so all of us have active and ongoing connections uh, with Russia and Eastern Europe, as well as teaching uh, and researching about it. One of the great strengths of CIS as an institution is our library. Uh, it's an award-winning library with over 400,000 volumes, and it really is one of the best libraries in the world for material on Russia and Eastern Europe. So if you come to study at CIS, you have a kind of a two, uh, double benefit in terms of libraries, uh, because you, of course, have access to the UCL main library, uh, which is a great general library with books on every topic you can imagine, and you have access to one of the world's very best libraries for specific material on Russia and Eastern Europe. One of the nice things about CIS as well is that you may have noticed as you walked in the building is that our library is right in the middle of the building. Um, this has a symbolic value. We like to think it's because it puts knowledge right at the center of the institution, but it's also very useful uh, because our students don't have to leave the building to go to the library and to find study space, uh, which, is, uh, which is something that they find very useful. The library is also open usually 24 hours throughout the term. So it may not sound now like you want to be in the library at 2 o'clock in the morning, but it's possible that that will be a convenient thing uh, at some point in your undergraduate career. And if that is something you would like to do, uh, it's right there for you. Um, CIS is also very lively. Again, one of the great things about its kind of dual status as a department and a leading research institute is that we have a lot of events and a lot of conferences, roundtable discussions, um, book launches. We have a lot of events with uh, leading figures from Russia, Eastern and Central Europe. You know, we have ambassadors coming. Let's see what's happening. It will come back. It sometimes does this. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, uh, famous writers from Russia or from Poland or from Germany come and launch their books here. Uh, we have close connections with, for example, Pushkin House just down the road in Bloomsbury, which is a central uh, Russian cultural center. We have art exhibitions. Um, and there's lots of opportunity for undergraduate students to not only attend these events, but also be involved in helping to organize them, uh, in coming up with ideas for events. I'm helping one of my students now organize a conference with uh, The Economist magazine, which is going to be about uh, the end of the Cold War. 
Um, so there's all sorts of opportunities like this, not just to attend events, but also to be part of uh, initiating them and organizing them. So why might you want to come to CIS uh, and learn a bit more about Russia and Eastern Europe? Um, well, there's all sorts of different reasons, and we can talk a bit in a, in a moment about what I think are the benefits of something that is both a generalist degree in many ways and a specialist degree in a particular region. Um, but focusing on the region for a moment, there's all sorts of reasons I think that it's useful to have uh, a BA that has a specialization in Russia, uh, Eastern and Central Europe. Um, now, this region is, of course, of enormous strategic, political, and economic importance uh, today. You only have to pick up a newspaper to read something about uh, political events in Russia or in Poland uh, or in Germany. Um, you know, these regions have been central not only to contemporary events but to recent historical events. If we think, I of course am a historian, so if we think about the history of the 20th century, um, you know, these are the regions in which two world wars uh, began. Um, they, the Soviet Union uh, and Eastern Europe were the site of a huge social experiment in the 20th century and Soviet-style communism. Now, Russia and Eastern Europe and Central Europe are incredibly multi-ethnic regions, multilingual regions, multi-religious regions. This is a region sort of at the frontier or the crossroads of um, Islam and Christianity, uh, of Europe and Asia, of East and West, of communism and capitalism in the 20th century. And one of the things that we really emphasize at CIS is thinking about how the study of these kinds of crossroads, of these kinds of frontiers where different sort of sorts of ways of thinking about the world have butted up against each other, how this can teach us important and new things about, about the world today. And as I mentioned, when we study this region, we're not just studying it in isolation. One of the big things that we emphasize at CIS is looking at this region in connection with its neighbors and with the rest of the world. So thinking, for example, about what EU expansion has meant for Eastern Europe since 2004, or thinking about what Russia's relationship with China means for the global economy, uh, for global strategic alliances, et cetera. So we're very much putting this in a kind of global context. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit now specifically about the actual degrees that we offer. Now, we have 18 BA degrees, so there's lots of different options and ways that you can think about uh, coming to and studying at CIS. Um, so I'll go through each of them. Now, some of them, when we say 18, some of them are sort of slight variations on one degree with a slight variation, so I'll talk a bit about that. Um, okay, so as you can see, we've got Economics and business with a year abroad, that's what YA means. Politics and sociology, Russian and East European languages and culture for which a year abroad is compulsory um, as part of a, a languages degree. And we have a degree in history, politics and economics. All right, so starting with economics and business with East European studies uh, option. And as I said, this is one of the ones where the year abroad is an optional thing. So you decide when you apply whether you want uh, to include your third year abroad. This is a degree that offers a grounding in economics and business um, and thinks about a sort of general education in economics and business and then how we might apply the lessons from that to uh, the region of uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. One of the big strengths of the economics and business degree at CIS is a particular focus on emerging economies. So thinking, for example, about the economic history of Russia and Eastern Europe in a global history, uh, sorry, in a global context of um, emerging economies in the past 20 years. 
Um, the, the staff who teach on this uh, degree have good relations with all sorts of organizations, including the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, um, the EU, uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, a lot of our economics and business staff are, are in active consultative roles uh, with a number of these organizations. And then there's an opportunity, as with all of our degrees, um, in the economics and business degree to learn a language as part of your uh, degree. Uh, and potentially to spend a year abroad as a way of solidifying that language learning as well. So you can choose a language option as part of the degree. And then if you've chosen that language option, you can also choose to spend a year abroad potentially in that country, Russia, Czech Republic, Poland, um, and work on your language uh, even more. Those are not compulsory, but they're options. Uh, so looking at the kind of structure of the economics and business degree, um, we have Foundational courses in the first year, things like intro to microeconomics, intro to macroeconomics, statistical methods. Uh, there's space to take some optional courses. Um, you can take them throughout in, in courses throughout C, so you could take a history course if you wanted, a politics course. And then in the uh, second and third years, you have a huge range of optional courses. So you've taken the compulsory courses in your first year, and then you have options like international trade, political economy, emerging market economies. And again, there's space within there for you to have options in politics, history, or languages. And just to sort of explain, so this is year two and three. If you take a year abroad, abroad that would be your third year, and then you'd come back and do the final year as your year four uh, at the end. OK, so then we have the politics, sociology, and East European studies. Again, with an optional year abroad. Again, you have the option of learning a language as part of uh, the degree. Um, this is a broad-based program which emphasizes theoretical, conceptual, and analytic tools of social science. And sort of similar to the economics and business degree, it provides a general education in those kinds of theoretical and conceptual tools that come out of the study of politics and sociology. And then some specific training in how these might be applied to the study of Russia and Eastern Europe. So again, we have a wide range of modules um, combining uh, politics and sociology. Um, there's the politics and sociology program has particularly strong connections uh, with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, uh, with a number of embassies, the Russian embassy, the Czech embassy. We had a delegation from the Czech embassy here just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and all of this, again, provides you with an opportunity not just to learn inside the classroom, but to learn through all of these extra events, uh, um, workshops, roundtables, uh, with people from these embassies, from the FCO, etc. So just to give a quick rundown of the structure, um, again, similar to economics and business, year one is mostly compulsory modules, although there's definitely space in there for you to also pick some options. Things like understanding politics, how politics works, introduction to social theory, introduction to political sociology, and then there's a compulsory module on communism uh, in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe as a kind of background to understanding uh, the region today. And then years two and three, you have options like history of political ideas, Russian politics, Russian foreign policy, uh, European security, and again, space in there for all sorts of options from the languages programs, uh, the history program, economics, uh, and the option to take uh, courses in other UCL departments. That's something that I'll just emphasize as well. Um, there's, within those optional modules, there's always space to take options from other UCL departments as well, and a lot of our students do that. So if there's something, perhaps you're interested maybe in comparisons between Russia and China. So you've taken your Russia politics uh, as part of the program here, and then you take a module on uh, politics in China in another department in uh, UCL. And that's not only a possibility, but we encourage uh, that kind of thing, because we very much see ourselves, of course, as embedded within UCL and within all of those different departments as well. OK, so I've mentioned a couple of times already that we have these options to learn languages. Um, and uh, you know, CIS offers um, 18 languages uh, from the region. Um, that's more than certainly any other uh, university or research institute in the UK, and I think more than anywhere else in Europe. Um, these languages are uh, uh, primarily the major languages of uh, the region. 
Uh, so Russian, of course, uh, which is the, the, probably the largest language program, but we also offer um, uh, classes and um, uh, courses in all sorts of other languages, Czech, Bulgarian, Romanian, uh, Serbo-Croatian. You can take evening classes in Estonian if you want to. Um, you know, there's really any Eastern European language you can think of. It's, it's pretty uh, certain that we, that we teach it. And again, along with these language programs come all sorts of uh, you know, cultural activities and uh, cultural events that we do to sort of foster a um, deep understanding, not just of the language, but of the culture of the region. Um, so one of the ways you can study these languages is as an option in your, say, a politics and sociology degree, but another way, of course, is by taking a degree in uh, one of those languages. So there's either the BA in Russian or the BA in East European mm -hmm. languages. Um, now, there's uh, four course units um, in each year of study for these. Um, now, the, the, uh, understandably, a lot of these course units are focused on uh, language learning. Um, uh, a number of the East European languages are taught from the very beginning, so on the basis of uh, no prior knowledge. Russian, because there is, of course, we, we do have students coming to us with uh, Russian A-level. So if you have taken Russian A-level, uh, there, there's two ways to start the Russian degree, either from the beginning or if you've taken Russian A-level, we have um, intermediate uh, beginning level, if that makes sense. If you, haven't, if you are learning from the very beginning with Russian, the degree involves four weeks spent of intensive language learning in Kazan in Russia in your first year as a way of sort of ideally bringing together the the beginner and intermediate strains eventually by the end of the first year. Um, there's also a joint degree in Russian and history that CIS offers, um, and this is quite a popular option. Um, uh, if you do the Russian and, and history degree, uh, you will take two course units in, uh, in Russian and two course units in history uh, throughout your degree. Um, and the history units can be taken either as CIS history units or in the UCL history department or intercollegiate college uh, courses within the U University of London. That's something else I'll mention. Um, you know, UCL is, of course, part of the wider University of London system. And another thing that we offer our students is the ability, if they see a course at Queen Mary or if they see a course at the LSE that they would really like to take, there's uh, the option of doing intercollegiate modules as well. Um, uh, now, an important thing to mention about the languages degree is, unlike the optional year abroad with the other degrees, the languages degree has a compulsory year abroad. So you, everyone who does the languages degree spends uh, a year in the country of the language that they're studying in their third year. Um, so I'll just talk a bit more about the year abroad uh, now. Um, so we have partner institutions across uh, the region, Russia uh, and Central, um, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, this is just a sort of a selection of our partner institutions, but they include the Charles University in Prague, the University of Belgrade, the University of Helsinki in Finland, uh, the University of Zagreb in Croatia, and then a number of institutions uh, in Russia. So universities in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yaroslavl, Tver, uh, and this doesn't even include it all. I think we have one in Kazan that we pair with. One of my students went to Irkutsk last year. So um, a number of institutions across the region uh, that we uh, partner with for the year abroad. And what happens essentially is that when you're on your year abroad, you're very much still a C student. So we have a, a program. Then you have uh, people here in London sort of looking after you, as it were, um, in, your, in the country abroad. But then you're also set up with a program of courses and study that you do at the partner uh, institution. You also have a supervisor during your year abroad back here that you can have regular um, you know, Skype or telephone conversations with and things like that to talk about how things are going. <clears throat> okay. And then, of course, people in country who are there at, uh, with the year abroad students. So a final degree program that I haven't mentioned yet, which is relatively new, uh, and we're very excited um, uh, and proud of it, um, is a particularly innovative interdisciplinary uh, degree program that's something that you wouldn't see offered um, at many other places uh, in the UK. And this is an interdisciplinary degree in history, politics, uh, and economics. Um, one thing about the uh, history, politics, and economics degree that I'll mention is that it doesn't currently have the option of a year abroad. Uh, we are looking into that, but at present, because this is a very new, new degree, it's not yet integrated, that option. So if you do definitely want to do a year abroad, uh, there's other, other degrees, the history, uh, economics and business, sorry, and politics and sociology that I might recommend. Um, otherwise, history, politics, and, and economics is a great option. 
Um, so we've combined these because we think that one of the great benefits of CIS compared to other departments um, uh, in other universities is precisely that we have this multidisciplinary uh, uh, staff, uh, people working from uh, the perspective of economics, from history, from politics. And we want to bring that together to provide this particularly uh, um, uh, unique uh, degree. So the idea is that students taking history, politics, and economics will come out with a strong foundation and background in all three disciplines, but also will come out with a foundation and background in how we can think across disciplines. So how politics might inform history, how history might inform our understanding of economics. So the idea is that this is a particularly unique opportunity to develop expertise in economics, politics, and history, and then apply this to the social, cultural, economic, and political world around us. So in the first year of an HP degree, again, there are a number of compulsory modules uh, that provide you with a background to each of these three um, areas. Uh, we've got an intro to politics, intro to macro and microeconomics. You also take a course called Frontiers of History, which I um, teach on, which I uh, ran this year. Uh, so that's a, a course that the history program here at CIS has specifically designed just for HPE students, um, and that introduces them to the history of Russia and Eastern Europe, but in a way that is emphasizing not so much learning about this region for its own sake necessarily, although that's good too, but what kinds of broader lessons about how we understand history and how we understand uh, history of um, multiple regions at once um, that we can then apply to other history classes that we take. So the emphasis is very much on how do we think of history not just as the history of Britain or the history of France, but instead a history of a whole region and the history of that region's connections with its neighbors. This is why it's called Frontiers of History. Again, there's space in that first year to do some electives, including uh, language electives. And then the way that it works is that in the second year, you sort of uh, drill down into your two favorite disciplines from the history, politics, and economics. And by the third year, you drill down into the one that you liked the most, the one that you take all the way through the three years. Uh, you also do a dissertation in that discipline, plus everyone comes back together to take a capstone course on 1989, Crisis and the New Global Revolution. So that's taught by economics, politics, and history um, uh, staff, uh, looking at the world after 1989 and the world that kind of the, the collapse of communism created. Okay, so I, I think I, I need to speed up a little bit. Um, I'm getting too excited about these degree programs and talking too much about them. Um, so one thing that, that you might want to know about is where do CIS graduates end up? Well, understandably, given that we have this emphasis on specialist knowledge of Russia and Eastern Europe, a number of graduates do end up in um, working in diplomacy, uh, working for think tanks that focus on the region, working in the region, um, going, you know, getting so interested in the region that they decide to go and, and, and find a job there. But there's also all sorts of other sectors that CIS graduates uh, end up in. We have graduates who work for public and private sector organizations like the IMF, uh, you know, various banks and financial institutions, certainly civil service and departments of government across Europe. And again, this is something where I think that the emphasis we place here on language learning and on deep understanding of particular regions really helps because that's sort of an added benefit that you can bring you know, to your career in the future and to employers. Diplomacy, as I've mentioned, of course, media, as we'll see in a moment. A number of our graduates go on um, into law, into NGOs, into teaching, um, and into postgraduate studies. Uh, and our students benefit from excellent career guidance and support. We have a number of opportunities for work experience, internships, and this is something that we take very seriously and very much, you know, as we're having these ongoing connections with embassies, uh, the government, uh, think tanks, we're always looking, you know, the media, um, uh, journalism, we're always looking for opportunities for our students to do work experience and internship as part of that. So we have a number of well-known alumni, perhaps the one that people recognize uh, most often is Jonathan Ross. Uh, but we also have people like Jacek Rostowski, who is, is an economist. He's also the former uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Poland and Finance Minister of Poland. Um, so, you know, so John Randall, who was the Deputy Chief Whip of the House of Commons, uh, the journalist Claire Hollingsworth, etc. Okay, so if you're thinking about applying to CIS, what kinds of things might you want to emphasize in your personal statements? Um, well, one is an understanding of the subjects and disciplines that you are applying specifically to the BA uh, to do. 
Um, another, of course, is regional interest. So as I've mentioned, you, know, you don't necessarily have to come to CIS. In fact, you definitely don't have to come to CIS with any strong background knowledge of this region at all. You know, we, we are very you know, prepared to, to teach from, from the bottom up of the region. Um, but we would like to see in your personal statements some suggestion of why you might want to learn more about Russia and Eastern Europe. We would like to see a willingness uh, to, for people to be global citizens and to understand the world around them, because that's obviously a strong emphasis of CIS. And then finally, we'd like to see a sense of your motivation. So what experiences and readings uh, have prompted you to want to take this course uh, in particular? So for more information, we have five minutes now for questions uh, and discussion. But also, um, on the fourth floor, just straight above us, um, the common room, uh, uh, the Masaryk room. So look for the sign for the fourth, uh, fourth floor common room when you go up there. Uh, we have the admissions team uh, ready to uh, answer any of your questions. And of course, you can always go to our website, uh, email our admissions team. And then if you apply and are successful, we'll have another open day uh, in February or March next year. So. We have five minutes for questions and discussion. Does anyone have any burning questions? Anything that was confusing? Or <laughs>